Good morning. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here today to the Smart Networks webinar, which is the third in a series hosted by Enable on Smart Cities. We have a great lineup of speakers here this morning for you. Um, and I'd like to um, just let you note that throughout the sessions and um, through the presentations, please do submit any questions that you have to the panelists. And we'll be answering those questions at the end for all. Um, and I'd like to now hand you over to Professor Dirk Pesch. Good morning, everybody, and um, and welcome to um, to this uh, third um, seminar that the uh, Enable Research Program um, uh, is running. So this is our second virtual one. The, the first one in March uh, on um, smart mobility was the last one we could hold in the first and last one we were able to actually hold in in person. But uh, but I'm delighted um, uh, to to start the third one. Today on smart networks, uh, the Enable Research Program is a um, is a national program um, investigating uh, a range of technologies from smart cities to uh, smart networks, smart environment, um, um, and is a and is a, a research program linked to three SFI centers: the the Connect Center for Future Networks, the Insight Center for Data Analytics, and the Lero Center for Software Engineering. Um, so today we have a, a great lineup of, uh, of speakers from industry and academia who will all be talking on about different aspects uh, uh, around smart networks and the future of connectivity. And since COVID, the COVID pandemic, we all know how important uh, really the, the connectivity is um, to keep us, to keep us actually, to, to keep our society going. Um, so we have, um, we have um, a number of um, the speakers. The first speaker is um, is Ian uh, Wheelock. Uh, Ian is a uh, an engineering fellow uh, with um, engineering fellow with Comsc with the Comscope uh, Chief Technology Officer. Um, he collaborates with senior technical leadership um, uh, in uh, around. Uh, uh, in telcos around the globe, provides trusted insight into future developments concerning uh, Wi-Fi, IoT, virtualization, and broadband connectivity. He supports internal business units on innovation, future technologies, and products, and has worked with academia and partners in European projects and also in the SFI Connect Center. I mentioned uh, his 11 patents and many more pending. So I hand over to, uh, to Ian uh, for the first talk. Thanks, Dirk. Uh, I'll just sc share my screen now. So, hi, I'm Ian Wheelock, as Dirk mentioned. I'm an engineering fellow with the CTO office at Comscope. And I have the pleasure this morning of presenting to you some details on developments within broadband networks that we're involved with uh, and the connectivity that we, we offer. So I'll co cover some of the impact of COVID-19 on broadband networks and follow with information about new developments and innovations that will be adopted to enhance the delivery of new smart services for broadband subscribers and subscribers in general. So before we develop, delve into the technology shifts, I'd just like to introduce you to Comscope. Uh, so it's a company that's been around for quite some time, uh, starting back in 1976. Uh, and we've been around for the evolution of pretty much the entire networking uh, space. We've shaped one of the most dynamic and technically challenging environments in the world uh, over the last 40, nearly 50 years, uh, from the two-way radio cable TV networks, all the way through the internet explosion and beyond. And what we've done as a company is we've invested heavily in technology over time. Um, and the most recent acquisition is with Aris, which is a company I, I was formerly part of. Uh, Comscope itself has about 15,000 patents and invests over $800 million a year in R&D. Uh, I joined Aris before that back in 2000. So I've been in the space for well over 20 years. And within Comscope, my primary role would be to offer advice to the broadband networks team and the home networks team, which are responsible for uh, fiber, DOCSIS, and uh, Wi-Fi innovations that we, we offer to cable subscribers. So 
So just to give you some insight regarding COVID and what we experienced with COVID. So we have a very close relationship with service providers and we can see firsthand the type of effect COVID had on their broadband networks. Obviously, everybody's experienced uh, various uh, performance issues with, with their network, but um, one of the main things that we saw and our operator friends saw was the shift in consumption, uh, changing from a usual four hour peak of usage, uh, typically later on in the evening to nearly an 18 hour all day event. So this was a staggering change to how the networks were operating before. Downstream bandwidth, uh, which would normally be used for video streaming, jumped by up to 86% uh, during the daytime. And even at nighttime, it was still going quite high. And the biggest surprise to us really was the upstream bandwidth, which do nearly doubled uh, to 150% of what we normally see in um, typical operation. And this is mostly due to voice over IP and video conferencing related to remote working and remote learning. So the good thing was that broadband networks based on DOCSIS and PON are typically designed with extra capacity to cope with these network changes. Uh, but nobody expected that the network would change so rapidly. In fact, some operators saw a whole year's worth of traffic growth occur in just two weeks at the start of COVID. And as you can see there, voice over IP and video conferencing was up nearly 300%, uh, again, all tied into remote learning and remote working. Now the spare capacity obviously saved the day because the networks didn't crash um, and it gave the operators plenty of time to react. However, it, it is clear from some of the, the surveys and things that have happened since then, and one particular one uh, done by Comreg showed that uh, users had actually started to see a major increase in their own broadband usage, uh, particularly since I think nearly 61% of the workforce started to work from home as a result of COVID. Uh, now at this COVID, or sorry, Comrade did two different surveys, one at April at the start of COVID and another follow-up in June. And it was quite interesting that at the start of COVID with the first survey, nobody thought, well, 25% thought they'd spend a bit more to get better broadband. But by June, that had increased to 50% of users would be willing to spend more money to be able to get a better service. So obviously this, the broadband network was coping, but it wasn't maybe delivering on the original promise or the original expectations subscribers had. Um, now, obviously service providers are trying to build networks that are able to deal with capacity expectations. Uh, and they use lots of statistics to do this. They use their own statistics as well as uh, looking at kind of projections like the Nielsen's law of internet bandwidth, which for the last 40 years has shown a 50% year on year growth in terms of the amount of bandwidth people consume in broadband networks. Um, I've just shown on the graph on the right hand side, the current, well, it's 2019, but it's a rough indication of what the maximum demands are on the network right now. So we're up around eight gigabits uh, downstream and two gigabits upstream. So it's a significant amount of bandwidth that are being used. Um, the Vodafone graph just shows again what type of impact the actual COVID uh, virus had on network users. So you can see this is a snapshot of seven days of a week and a 24 hour period. And you can see the significant gap between what was original at the start of COVID and what had happened literally two weeks after COVID had begun. So this is a massive shift in the amount of bandwidth and this was for an upstream. So this goes back to the 150% increase figure I mentioned earlier. Now, most networks they're configured um, with a 10 to one downstream upstream ratio. But the problem is obviously when you start to saturate the upstream, you affect the downstream. And one of the things that causes that is upstream video conferencing. So networks are going to have to change to be able to support extra capacity. Certainly this working from home and learning from home is putting a massive increase on the actual network itself. Um, and just one sec. But obviously this is the new normal and some of the consequences of this new normal right now are that download upload times are increasing and quality of experience is being affected because packets are being dropped or being delayed. 
And another key thing is that traditionally people have bandwidth caps. They're not allowed to go above a certain limit of bandwidth. Now, because they're consuming so much, they're actually hitting these caps. So service providers are having to come to terms with this new reality and are having to plan and invest even more and have invested over the last six months significant money just to keep ahead of the bandwidth curve that's changed. Um, now, that's just kind of covering what has happened with COVID, uh, but within the broadband space itself, there's plenty of technology and service innovation happening. And what this diagram shows is the inner segment talking about the various technologies and standards that have been developed um, to support internet uh, delivery, be they cable or PON networks or Wi-Fi networks um, or even IoT networks. And these are the cornerstone features that we use in developing new hardware technology. Uh, and the inner segment shows the different types of uh, platforms we build on top of these hardware technologies. Uh, and those really are about trying to enable the broader sense of smart applications that people want uh, in their homes. Uh, the outer segment shows a snapshot of a lot of the applications that we're looking at uh, and how these, we'll talk about some of how these are done in the next couple of slides. Um, we'll cover 10 gigabit broadband, uh, broadband gateways, a, a new device called a smart media device and Wi-Fi as well. So just going back to the comment about the networks and having enough capacity in the networks, I, I've shown three different network technologies here. One is cable, fiber, and fixed wireless access. Uh, all three are currently available within Ireland as ways of receiving broadband. There's different, obviously because they're different technologies, they have different capabilities. And what I've shown at the top is the cable, uh, roadmap, I guess, where we have currently deployed products, today's products and future products. So within the cable space, we're, we're seeing that the network can cope with um, a lot of bandwidth today already. Uh, obviously, a, a 10 gigabit down and a 1 gigabit up shared between hundreds of users. So everybody can get a lot of bandwidth, uh, but it's, it's a matter of how much of that is actually deployed. It, it's a variable technology. So just because you have DOCSIS 3.1 doesn't mean that you get 10 slash 1 speeds. You might only get, depending on your subscription, 200 megs down and 20 megs up. But the technology is there and the evolution of that technology continues to a point where with DOCSIS 4.0, uh, we're proposing a symmetric 10 gigabit up and down. Similarly in fiber, there's a lot of deployed GPON uh, networks out there. Um, that would take up a lot of the fiber to the premise that's currently in the Irish broadband mix. And as time goes on, more technology like XGPON and XGSPON has been adopted. So for instance, um, a lot of networks are trying to make up the mind around XGPON versus XGSPON. And the National Broadband Plan in Ireland has decided to vote with XGSPON. So that gives us an opportunity to have a scalable network that will last for many, many years and offer 10 gigabits symmetric. So depending on the number of users, something like that could easily uh, remain active for 20 years in the network. Um, and obviously the next step on that is a quadrupling in the downstream bandwidth with TWDM PON. So that, that's a significant shift. Within fixed wireless access, uh, lots of services today in Ireland rely on 4G as the basis for uh, 4G LTE as the basis for fixed wireless access. And what we're starting to see is the advent of 5G and the deployment of, of millimeter wave 5G networks. And what's that going, what that is going to do is offer fiber-like speeds, uh, however, over shorter, much shorter distances maybe than either cable or fiber can offer. But it will offer some speeds about 20 times faster than the current LTE network. So it's, it's a massive shift uh, across all three technologies for increasing bandwidth and obviously the increasing bandwidth enables more bandwidth into the home faster bandwidth more services and lower latency so it all adds up to a, a recipe to create smart networks and better networks in the future i've just shown a, fit, a snapshot of where ireland is relative to the fixed broadband mix and as you can see uh, the technologies that are most capable of getting to 
a gigabit and beyond comprise 37% of the network. Um, but we do see that VDSL, which is 43% of the network, will actually start to convert over to fiber over the next two or three years. And much of that we don't know. And obviously the national broadband plan is also in place so that will also introduce new um, fixed broadband support. And just to talk about how uh, the networks, as I said earlier, just because you can get 10.1 doesn't mean you, you are actually paying for 10.1. Um, subscriber levels within, or subscriber packages within cable, as an example, can go up to a gigabit today. Uh, and just two days ago, Virgin Media in the UK were able to demonstrate a 2.2 gigabit trial for subscribers in a specific town in the UK. So they're literally just changing the knobs in the network and are able to increase the extra bandwidth to consumers without having to redeploy or tear up networks um, just to get that bandwidth. Now, the network is one part of it, but the broadband gateway platform is the other part. And it's, it's really important because it acts as the bridge from the broadband network into the home. And it connects everything in the home. Most of them have a product life of about five to eight years. Uh, and part of the reason there is, you know, software advances, you need more RAM and flash or storage. Um, Wi-Fi improves. So the older Wi-Fi, you know, you, it can still work, but it may not be compatible with the newest consumer electronic devices that come along. So as a result, it's a typical life of five to eight years. Now, every gateway that's shipped today is Wi-Fi enabled. And the newer ones that are coming out uh, include this technology called Wi-Fi 6, which is the latest version of Wi-Fi that's being created. And we'll talk a bit more about the different versions of Wi-Fi in a few minutes. Another thing about the broadband gateway platforms is if we get a capability of 10 gigabit coming to us, we need to have you know, another capability in the home to get traffic around. So we have gigabit at 2.5 gigabit ethernet networking now. And this really helps spread that broadband connection around the network. Um, and one of the key points now with the new platforms is that the, high sp the more performance the gateway has to have for 10 gigabit, the more CPU it has. And that's created a new environment where we can actually run software and value services on the gateway. So rather than the gateway just being a router, it's now come in to being an actual platform for services. Um, and to be able to do that, there's new open source software platforms. Uh, I mentioned two of them here, which are RDK and PRPL, which is purple. And these are new environments that people can develop software. Uh, third party software developers can download applications into this platform and bring new services into the home. Um, it's looking like an open ecosystem, so anybody can develop applications. Obviously, they do need to have some arrangements with the broadband provider to get onto the platform, but that may change in the future as well. And one final thing with gateways is we're introducing Internet of Things connectivity. So in some gateways, we are inter integrating Zigbee, Z-Wave, um, Bluetooth, just to act as a bridge to the rest of the home. And obviously the software services running in the gateway can take advantage of that and create new and interesting services for people to use. Um, Obviously, the broadband gateway is, is the entry into the home. Uh, there are a lot of deploy gateways around the world. Um, Comscope, as an example, sells about 20 million devices a year for broadband. There's an existing deployed um, set of routers there. So not all of them can support the latest and greatest features. So new, a new class of device called a smart media device is being introduced. And what this is, is a combination of different hardware technologies so that we can create a multi-sensory environment for new services. So th what this really means is that within that little box in the top right hand corner, we'll have every single IoT radio we need, we'll have advanced Wi-Fi, and we'll have software services that can now bring together all of the sensors in a home. Uh, it can include things like Wi-Fi motion for healthcare, uh, well not healthcare, but uh, aging in place type applications and care at home place where we need to do fall detection or movement and even for security we, we can incorporate that as well but the new smart media device is, is an all-encompassing platform which will try to bring all of these sensors together 
to enable brand new smart services. Um, a lot of these services are things uh, to help people, an aging population, stay at home longer rather than having to uh, go into nursing homes. Uh, obviously, care at home is about telemedicine and supporting people living at home independently uh, while still needing medical treatment. Uh, and obviously, home security and environment building controls are typical things, but these are just tip of the iceberg applications that these new platforms are going to be able to support. Um, and obviously, these are independent of the broadband gateway, so people will be able to deploy this type of thing into any network without necessarily any support from a broadband uh, operator to do, do so. And now we'll just move on to the last topic, which is Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi evolution. Uh, so there's been yes. significant developments over Come the last two the years. End. Okay, I'm nearly there. Uh, significant developments in the last two years where Wi-Fi 6 is the latest technology. So um, it brought significant performance boost to Wi-Fi and it's nearly four times or 40% faster than the previous version. Um, but it also helps with higher density um, environments. It can do channel reuse. So basically it's brought a whole suite of new features that are able to improve how Wi-Fi worked previous compared to the previous version. Um, one of the key things with Wi-Fi 6 is actually in the IoT space where because of changes in the protocol, we're now able to get nearly 10 times the amount of battery for an IoT device than we did before. So it's nice to have IoT devices share the same infrastructure as the existing Wi-Fi system that exists in a, in a network. A brand new change is for six gigahertz. So regulatory groups at the moment are finalizing plans to add between 500 megahertz and 1.2 gigahertz of unlicensed spectrum for Wi-Fi, which is the first time any real spectrum has been added in 20 years. So by spring next year, the European Union will have enabled um, nearly double the amount of spectrum uh, for Wi-Fi use. In the US, it's even more, it's 1.2 gigahertz of spectrum. And one key thing about that is an economic report in the US indicated that by 2025, this six gigahertz spectrum would actually benefit the US economy by over $180 billion, purely by letting Wi-Fi run over the network, uh, the new network. So it, it's a significant uh, change in Wi-Fi and hopefully by spring next year, we will start deploying units using this technology. And then if that wasn't enough, we, we're now actually tripling the bandwidth by going to Wi-Fi 7. Uh, and there's a host of new features coming along with that that are being specified at the moment, but won't come through until 2024. So just to sum it all up, um, broadband access is constantly evolving. Sorry, broadband delivered during COVID-19. So it met the demand and people were able to actually uh, continue working and doing things that maybe they had never done before on their networks. Um, broadband access is constantly evolving to match the never ending customer bandwidth needs. Uh, and broadband gateways are getting smarter and faster than ever before, offering new capabilities to act as platforms for smart services in the future. Uh, Multi-sensory SMD platforms will enable advanced services by bringing together IoT and Wi-Fi uh, and to offer such services as aging in place, care at home, security, and home building control. And finally, advanced Wi-Fi connectivity will enable smarter networks through all of the innovations that have happened in the last few years. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, this was a very interesting overview, and I, I, I liked also to the... Um, the into you know the the, the context uh, around the current um, COVID situation. So that's interesting to see um, what effect that has and how it will drive uh, evolution. So uh, uh, for the audience, uh, please keep your um, your questions for later. We will have we'll we'll go through the panelists and then we we'll have a extensive question and answer session. So please keep your questions in mind for the moment. We'll come back to them and you'll have an opportunity to ask. So our next speaker is, uh, is Cormac Srinen. Uh, Cormac is a uh, professor and head of computer science at University College Cork. 
where he directs a research lab uh, investigating uh, wireless networking. Uh, before joining UCC, he was a research scientist at at and Bell Labs in Murray Hill in the US. Cormac is a um, uh, SFI principal investigator and deputy director of the Connect Research Center, which I've mentioned already. Um, he holds a PhD in computer science from Cambridge University. So I'll hand over to Cormac and uh, we look forward to, to the presentation. Hi Dirk, can you, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, very good. Great, and you can see my slides I presume? Yes, thank you. Excellent, that's great, thank you. It's ironic that uh, the sem seminar is on smart networks and I was having problems, uh, problems connecting with my network, but anyway. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I think this is a, an exciting and uh, very timely uh, webinar on, on this topic. Um, and I think uh, Ian has captured um, uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, I suppose, recent challenges that network operators in particular have had because of the COVID uh, uh, situation. Um, I, I'm going to start by, I suppose, encouraging us to step back a little bit um, and, and maybe think a little bit what we mean by the term smart networks, because um, we, we might be tempted to think that smart networks are synonymous with AI in networks. Um, and in recent years, that, that certainly has been the view. But for, for, for those of us who've been around long enough, um, we realize that um, networks have been smart or intelligent for quite a long time. And I just wanted, I suppose, fill people in briefly um, on, on that history. Um, and we're, we're talking really about starting in the 1980s with uh, developments in the telephone network, uh, the PSTN, um, and a shift in the 1980s led by AT&T to, um, to having centralized network control. Um, and if that sounds familiar, of course, that's what we come back to um, in later years in the form of SDN. Um, so the notion of having centralized control, and that in turn um, allowed uh, the network operator to provide considerably more um, intelligent services. So there was a, a phrase at the time called the intelligent network, which allowed more sophisticated services, things like 800 numbers, to be added on um, to the telephone network in a much more uh, simplistic and uh, time-sensitive manner. Moving forward um, and moving to the internet world um, in the 1990s, um, there was considerable excitement and activity on the area of active networking. Um, the idea being that you want to have a little bit more programmable control over what happens to your data as it goes through the network. Um, and the idea behind active networking was that the, the packets themselves held some important information that allowed the switches of the routers um, uh, that influenced how the routers processed their packet. But the contents of the instructions were in the packets themselves. So that makes it quite different um, to the view uh, taken some years later in SDN. However, active networking, while it didn't really um, gain ground commercially for a variety of reasons, in a sense it was probably too early, um, it did seed a lot of work um, in the late 1990s, early 2000s um, on programmable network systems like the Tempest from the University of Cambridge, the idea of network virtualization through switchlets and Zen, all of that came around in, the, in, in, that, in that era. Um, and again, all driven by the idea of wanting to have more control over the network, right? And ultimately, when you have control, that leads you then to having a network which is, at least in principle, can be smart. More recently then, of course, in, in, in the uh, 2008 period, uh, we have SDN and network function virtualization, which from our perspective really is the way that lead, the path that leads the way to having intelligent networks by moving the control into centralized locations and being able to layer and intelligent services on top of that. So this is kind of the history. Today, where are we? Today, we're at the point where we see networks that are starting to be more data driven and hence the need for artificial intelligence or machine learning techniques. And I'm gonna focus on that for the remaining couple of minutes that I have, just to give you some examples and illustrate exactly what that means, right? So again, just to summarize, we see the developments of central control leading to greater agility and increased complexity. And that's exactly where it takes us to machine learning. So the, the argument for having machine learning in networks is to, is to allow you to have smart decisions for designing and operating networks. And there's lots of examples. If you look in the literature and in, 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 in the commercial world, there's a lot of interest in using machine learning for network deployment planning, uh, network management, resource allocation, fault prediction, and so on. However, there's also a lot of excitement to be using AI methods to enable new services that sit atop a network. So I think we see a distinction between using AI as a tool for designing and operating networks versus AI as a driver for those networks, where AI is providing the applications 
um, that sit on top of those networks and generate the traffic um, and, and need a very agile resource management. Wireless networks in particular pose a challenge because of their increasing complexity. As we look towards, um, towards 6G in particular, there's a demand at all layers of the stack for greater agility and adaptability, particularly in wireless channel resource use. The scale of devices, particularly when we look at IoT devices, and the heterogeneity in terms of service quality needed um, is quite diverse. Um, and this means that the network needs to be able to act, react quickly um, and intelligently in terms of allocating resources to different services. And the question really that I suppose that's being, uh, that has been raised is, do our, do our standard ways of doing this work when you need this level of agility and when you have such complex networks? Is it still okay, can it still work to have optimization that is essentially uh, based on rules-based systems? So something happens, you look up a rule, and you take some action. Can that work in a system where um, there's greater adaptability needed? So I'm going to illustrate this just with a couple of examples from my own research, just to give you a sense of the kind of places that you can use ML in networks. Um, so on the left, this plot is a video streaming example. Um, this is work done in collaboration with AT&T in the US and my group in Cork. Um, and this really is using um, throughput prediction in cellular networks. So we're using um, uh, machine and deep learning techniques to try and predict throughput um, over the cellular interface in a cell. Um, and here what we see is the um, a time, uh, a time on the x-axis, throughput on the y-axis. And I suppose the key thing to look at here are uh, the lines with, without and with throughput. So with and without TP, as it's mentioned on the slide. Um, and the key thing to note is that um, you see that when you have no throughput prediction, you do see some stalls in the video. So this is playing back video, streaming video. Um, stalls, as you know, are very annoying. So we see quite a few stalls here where, when there's no uh, when there's throughput prediction, while the data rate on average is a bit lower, we are avoiding stalls. So that seems like a good result. Um, on the right hand side is other work that my group have done recently, um, again applying machine learning, here to choose the right video rate. So streaming, um, GASH based video streaming selects, makes a decision every few seconds to select uh, the best video rate. And this technique, which we call SMASH, takes um, what you might call a brute force type approach. It essentially looks at what other video streaming techniques have done in the same conditions and what the result was. And it uses that to guide its own choice. So if you like, it's not that intelligent, right? It's just looking at what all the other techniques would have done in that situation and how did it work out? So these are just two very specific examples. I do want to point out though, that while we tend to associate SMART with ML these days, um, there are a lot of other AI techniques that can be used um, in networking. Again, these are some examples of, of work we've done in the past um, with uh, colleagues Ken Brown and others in, in the Insight Group. Um, we see uh, you know, the use of adaptive search techniques, which are widely used in AI. Uh, we use those for uh, designing resilient topologies and sensor networks. Um, we see agent-based planning, um, which is used in robotics. Um, we use that for taking IoT-type sensor data on building occupancy and the spread of a hazard, in this case, a fire, to guide people out of a building. Um, and then finally, um, we have more recent work on using path planning for guiding autonomous robots, uh, sorry, UAVs, um, for searching for someone who's lost based on the use of radio, cellular radio signals. So again, these might be more, I suppose, more in the driven um, category that I mentioned earlier. So these are sitting on top of the network um, and using um, uh, data, but expecting the network to be very agile. So what do we see in the future? So it looks like we're moving towards a data-driven uh, form of network design and operation. Um, and this may be transformative. It has a number of different elements. So the descriptive element, using historical data to gain insights about the network, you know, we've, we do that already. Um, I guess the difference is um, we may not be using ML-type techniques to spot for patterns that we hadn't seen before. Um, detecting problems automatically, um, based on analysis of large volumes of data, um, using predictions for future network conditions, like the example I mentioned a second ago. Um, and then finally, being prescriptive, so making smart decisions based on those predictions. So there's a lot of opportunities for network designers and operators to have a smart network. Um, but there's different aspects to what smart means, and it does require a very serious rethink of many aspects of the network design and operation. 
And in case it looks like I'm painting a very rosy picture, um, I think there are some very serious risks with this approach. Um, and we're very early days in using machine learning in, in networking. Um, and I think there's a number of things we need to be aware of or at least um, pay some attention to. Um, one is, I think, um, this data-driven approach comes with a cost. The cost is sensing the data. How do you collect it? Where do you collect it in the network? You have to transport it, store it, and use it for computation somewhere. In some cases, you need to do this in very, very short um, timeframes, particularly when you look at using ML, for example, at the physical layer in wireless networks. How can you make this cost effective? Finally, um, or secondly, I should say, um, overlooking systems issues. Um, so a lot of the techniques for AI and ML were developed for other applications, applications which are, which are not perhaps as time sensitive as some of the decisions you need to make in networking. So image analysis, for example. So we need to be careful that when we look at employing these ML techniques or deep learning techniques, look at the convergence times and look at the robustness. How are they robust when the data is, is very messy or, or indeed absent? In some cases, you don't have all the data you need. And then finally, and this has become somewhat of a topic in the AI community also in recent days, this notion of explainable AI. But in networks, I think it's really important for us, right? Um, what happens when things go wrong in the network? Are we going to be able to go back and look inside the black box that's taking in the data and giving us the decision to figure out what exactly went wrong? How do we make sure that the ML solution isn't learning the patterns we don't want it to? That due to our domain specific knowledge, we know is not a pattern that would be particularly useful. So I guess to sum up, I think, you know, the notion of a smart network is not new in the sense that networks have been smart for a long time in different ways. Um, I think the, the current focus on data-driven networks shows great promise, but I think there are some things we need to, we need to watch out for. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Cormac. Uh, that was a, uh... Very interesting talk, and I, I'm sure that uh, the the, uh, um, the particular the risks you mentioned, uh, I, I think, will will hopefully generate some interesting questions as well. Um, so we move to the next speaker now. Um, the next speaker is uh, Kevin uh, McDonald from um, from Huawei, and um, he uh, is a research director at Huawei Island Research Center. Um, his uh, recent work is focused on intelligent automation and automatic driving networks for future networks using knowledge management, intent-based networking, and control loop automation. Uh, he's a work stream leader uh, for technical architecture um, for the Autonomous Network Project of the TM Forum, and he also participates in other uh, standards-related activities like in 3GPP, Etsy, etc. So I'll hand over to, to Kevin um, for his talk. Um, my name is Ken McDonald, and together with uh, Alexander Milanovic, who you'll meet later on, we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, something that Cormac has already addressed, really, you know, the, the smart networks and, and the challenges with them. And uh, as Professor Sh uh, Srinan said, I, I don't want to paint an overly rosy picture of it because uh, we, we have made progress, but I'm going to describe to you what I think is some of the important aspects of it. So, so <clears throat> if, there's, if there's one thing I think we can agree on, it's that complexity is really only going to go in one direction, and that's up. And this, this visual here of a network diagram is really a snapshot of of that kind of complexity. So this is an example of a network diagram from one of our customers in Korea. And it's a good diagram, but there's a lot going on. There's slicing, there's edge, the distributed cloud. Um, there's a lot of connected devices that, that Ian talked about uh, in, in the first presentation. And, and really this is just a snapshot. So when you take in perhaps 5G and, what, and beyond 5G and 6G, when we start thinking about introducing satellite networks and UAV networks that were mentioned. Really, we're, we're gonna go from almost geographic planning to, to spatial planning. And this is great, this is exciting when, when everything's working, but when things don't work, you need to troubleshoot it. And that's where the, the operations come in. So to address 
this challenge of, of, of increasing operating costs, Huawei has kind of developed a vision together with the industry, what we call autonomous driving networks. And it kind of builds on the autonomous driving car vehicle uh, metaphor, if you like. So we're, we're coming up with a framework to address it. Um, as you can see in the diagram, AI is a part of it, but it's not the, it's not the essential ingredient to it, as in many ways we can deliver autonomy uh, using many typical techniques, leaving out machine learning, etc. But a lot of what we're doing in terms of the prediction space is using machine learning. It's using it at, at all the layers, right from the devices at the local layer uh, to make an online decisions right up into the cloud. And again, uh, the kind of solutions we have focus on wireless networks, core networks, transport networks, as you can see in the, the middle of that ADN diagram. And then also we bring to, together with an end-to-end -end cross domain approach. But I'm not really here to promote our portfolio. I just want to talk a little bit more about the, the real challenges. So James Croshaw, um, who, who, who some of you will know, who's very active in the OSS space, he's, he's a kind of a key analyst with Amdia. And he, he talks about the challenges in this way. He talks about with really troubleshooting any network is difficult really. And the what to do with all the data in this data-driven network is gonna be an issue. And we really need to be adaptive, so that are self-adaptive. And that means basically responding at the right time. And we need to do it quickly uh, because these issues are time sensitive. Um, secondly, I think w you know when things go wrong, the service assurance side, which will close the loop, we need to be, getting out ahead of the incidents. We need to be able to predict those risks uh, better than currently what we're doing and then take preventative actions so that you know these issues um, are addressed. And all of that actually benefits the customer experience. So the third point here really is that while machine learning, et cetera, is very good at certain optimization of constraints, it really has to be into what we call multi-objective. So how do you balance and get an equilibrium of what's good for the network and what's good for the actual customers it's serving. So all of that needs to get some kind of equilibrium. Now that I've explained a little bit about those challenges, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I think is autonomy is about. And you know, in these future networks as represented here by the machine, these autonomous systems, we want them to do more. And as Cormac said, we, we want them to take make more of the decisions, make the smart decisions. And why? Because we're going to free up the humans. So right now, um, the, this balance isn't really there. And how how we can do it, I think, is, is thinking about really what humans are good at versus what machines are good at. So I think um, machines are really good at the kind of routine stuff, you know, where uh, it, it, it can do it over time and it can multitask much, much better than humans. Humans think we can, but we can't. But we're much better at kind of judgment and the abstract tasks like creative thinking. And just to give an example of what I'm talking about, for example, if you take a, a, a NFV with a VNF network fully virtualized and you get an issue with it, the machine knows what to do. It, it knows actually it's simpler to release the, the faulty node and actually spin up a new container of VM and the service is back running. So that's that's an example of the machine. Whereas when you get into more subjective areas around, for example, SLO breaches uh, that might affect your number one customer, it's less, less good at that. And that's where humans are currently intervening. So this dynamic between the humans and machines is really what a town is about. I see it as a kind of a continuum or a slider, as we can see here. And what, what we're really talking about is how do we control this dynamic better? How can we shift the responsibility in a, in a controlled way from the human to the machine so that we can get more autonomy? And how we do that really is, 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 is in a very graduated, way so think of this as like the six gears in your car we want to be able to move them up uh, uh, over time for different processes and tasks and obviously the ultimate goal is is to is to this le level five autonomy um 
and this is super important, this is really what the industry are trying to standardize around these levels. And um, one such example, and probably the key one that, you know, personally I've been involved in has been working with the TM Forum, uh, uh, trying to, to bring the industry together around these standards about what it means to be level zero, which is fully manual, all the way up to level five. And the TM Forum, we've been working in multiple fora really, um, Etsy, 3GPP, GSMA and others, but all of those communities, you know, in the TM Forum, between 30 and 60 different companies all collaborating together to really tease out how we can understand uh, what these levels mean. So if you look at the middle of the diagram, you can see a kind of the black and gray. That's they're the, the steps of how we move from uh, all humans doing everything to a blend and then ultimately the machines taking more of the responsibility. And the, 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 the definitions on the side are really the life cycle of the, the decision making. These decision cycles are closed loops and it starts really with the awareness. So awareness is knowing what's going on in the environment. Analysis is about using all that data to make uh, predictions. Um, and then decisions is actually uh, taking the right actions, uh, w which is done by the execution. And all of that is kind of uh, orchestrated using intent. Um, and again, I won't go into the full technical details of, how, of the framework, but I will talk a little bit more about why I think this is really important for everyone and why we should be doing it. So this is the autonomous network strategy. It's a strategy map and at the top, these yellow ovals at the top, I hope you can, you can read the text, but these are the business drivers behind us. This is the purpose behind it. And it's really got a, a two key drivers. One is to reduce the operational efficiency and at the same time trying to increase revenues. So how do we do that? We do that by improving the cost structure, getting better asset utilization, and at the same time, allowing, our, our, uh, allowing the networks to expose better and new services that will just improve the customer experience. So they're, they're, they're really, uh, that's, that's the thinking behind it, but how we do that is, in, is rather interesting because we have to think about what these networks are about. They're about serving the customer and that's really about giving them this experience. And it's characterized by the red ovals in the middle. Zero touch, zero trouble, zero weight and zero friction. And what that means, it, it's a totally different experience than what you're currently doing, dealing with today. Because ultimately, really, if this visual on the side hopefully helps. It's the, the customer doesn't really see the network. It sees the services and products that are offered. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's almost invisible. So what we need to create is that invisible experience. But we clearly need a lot to, to, to realize that. And that's what's done in these green ovals. These are what we call the self-X or the self-management capabilities. So there are a hierarchy of them and there's more than the ones that I show here. But this is critical to how we realize these future networks because we need to be able to create uh, control loops that actually achieve what those self-X say. So they need to be self-healing, they need to be self-protecting, and that's all done through some of the work that we're, that we're gonna be doing and some of the research that we're gonna be doing. So uh, in, 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 in conclusion, again, I've talked a little bit about the, about the dynamic between the humans and the machines and some of the challenges and the, the research that we need. So uh, under Alex in our research lab, these are the kind of specific areas that we think are important currently. So as I said, the, the, the complexity is increasing, the data volumes are increasing, um, issues of data quality, data governance, data lineage, all that. So we need intelligent data management. Um, equally, the way that we're approaching operations need to change. We need to be able to uh, handle multiple objectives, even conflicting ones together. And to do that, we need these kind of optimization techniques such as adaptive multi-objective control. Knowledge is gonna be paramount 
for, for most things that we're doing. And currently we have knowledge, but we don't look after it. They're in the heads of our human experts in 5G and in different domains, et cetera. We need to do a better job of curating that. And to do that, we need knowledge management. Um, some of the techniques uh, that were mentioned, adaptive search, knowledge bases, knowledge graph, and, and exposing that as knowledge as a service, all of that comes into, the, into focus. But let's say we've, we've done that, right? We've done these other ones uh, that I've just described, and those sliders are kind of coming into view. They're becoming more of a reality. Even then, we still need to think about the humans because we need to build their trust in all that automation. That means getting the confidence of, 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 doing, of doing that. And I guess an example of it is, if you go back to the autonomous driving analogy and, and the levels, I think, you know, it's very, I think people mentally can see how you can get humans to take their hands off the wheel in the car. But it's a much bigger ask to get them to take the eyes off the road. And I think equally, this is kind of the similar thing. We, we need to build their confidence and the trust that these smart networks are going to do the right thing. And to do that, again, we need to be focusing in human machine interaction and in, in, in reasoning. So I think as, as the other speaker said, I think we make great strides really um, in particular forms of the machine learning space. I think for, for example, in speech to text and video recognition or face recognition, you know, good, good, good progress um, because it's more in that timely adaptive uh, decision making. In the judgment area, I think, you know, we've done de decent progress. But ultimately, the reasoning and cognitive work, we're a bit of ways yet, and we need to, you know, uh, uh, get get some additional research in those areas to realise the smart decision making. So, I'm uh, very excited. This is our vision, and I'm very excited to to share it with you and to work and collaborate with the kind of talent that we have here in Ireland, and uh, and delighted to to have this opportunity to present to you this morning. So thank you very much. And uh, that concludes my presentation, Dirk. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, very interesting uh, vision. And, and a lot of this correlates with what some of the other speakers have said. And I'm, I'm, I, I bet there's more, more to come along those lines. Um, so just to the audience, please keep your questions uh, and answers uh, uh, coming. Uh, I'm, I forgot to mention you have a Q&A tool, so please write them in. There is some have already done that and we will come back to them um, during the, the Q&A session at the end. So uh, our next speaker now is uh, Marco Ruffini, who is Associate Professor and Fellow of Trinity College. Uh, and a principal investigator in both the IPIC uh, uh, Research Center for Photonics and the Connect Center for Future Networks, uh, where he's also the, um, the deputy director. Um, Marco leads the Optical Network uh, Architecture Group in, in Trinity, and his uh, main research is in 5G optical networks, um, where he carries, on, uh, carries out work in uh, convergence of fixed mobile and access metro networks and the virtualization of next generation networks. Uh, he leads a number of um, uh, Horizon Europe, um, um, Horizon 2020 and SFI projects. And very interestingly, uh, he is the, the director or the lead on the new uh, uh, Beyond 5G testbed for Dublin, which was uh, introduced or presented uh, or launched uh, on, on, on Tuesday. So I'll hand over to Marco uh, to talk about, uh, about open networking. Thanks, Dirk, for the introduction. Just uh, make sure that uh, you can hear me. Yeah, very good. Yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah, so today I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the concept of open networking. And I think it follows up a little bit on the discussion that um, Cormac has introduced uh, uh, earlier on. Now I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna skip on this, um, on my presentation and my research group. And so first of all, what's, what's open networking? So I think the concept is that, that you want to open a closed and proprietary system so that the same functionality can actually now be done by putting together system from different entities, okay? So it's a bit like a, instead of buying everything from one vendor, you are now able to mix and match and obtain exactly the same result. So this is the theory. Now, this is an example, let's say the open run, which is for the mobile network, okay? And you can see here like a graph uh, from the from the run um, form. This basically means that if you want to open up the system, what you have to do is that you need to specify the functional blocks, so the different functions that are required to make this work. 
and especially you need to standardize the interface okay and the concept is that once the interface which is you know basically is, the interfaces are the way that this box connect to each other if those are standardized and open uh, open specific with open specification then everyone can build any box okay as far as they agree with the interfaces uh, they can do that and that's the way you know things have been opened up in every system like compute system and so on okay now one question is that is this oran like uh, is this only happening with oran or is spread out the network and the, of course it's spread out the network i mean the oran is kind of a fold up from the concept of cloud run where you open up a base station and you show all the little blocks that's inside and oran is just you can think of that maybe as a commercialization of this concept but you know this has happened also in the central office for example the core project from the open network foundation has done the similar thing where you take a central office made up of preparatory boxes and you open it all up and now you build a small data center instead that where most of the things run the software and again you know go down to the optical world you can you'll find the same optical disaggregation means that you know up to today you have to buy it then all the entire system from one vendor so all the switches, amplifiers, transponders, control system, and so on from one vendor. This aggregation means now, you know, in principle, you might be able to buy them from different vendors. Now, again, you know, this is kind of a bit of theory, yeah? um, which means it doesn't exactly work in practice uh, yet like that. Now, what are, why are people doing that? What are the pros and what are the cons? Now, greens are the pros and uh, red are the cons, and, you know, you, could, you can add more, and it would be great to have a discussion about this later on. But, you know, the cons is, first and foremost, avoid vendor lock-in. I believe this is the single reason why these operators are pushed for that. So, basically, means if you now... Vendor lock-in is when you, you know, you start buying things for one of one vendor, and because the network only, sorry, the device from the vendor only work with each other, you have to keep buying devices from that vendor. Otherwise, you have to substitute the entire network. Now, avoid vendor lock-in now means that now you can add new features from other vendors, okay? So basically, you can get the best features from different vendors. You can mix and match and get the best out of it. It creates some more competitive environments, okay? So that, of course, is gonna lower the cost, but it's also introducing more research, okay? So this really enables university and SME to take a part in the research independently, which means, you know, we don't have to cooperate with a specific vendor to get insight into that box because now the box is open and we can develop our own things and maybe, you know, there's gonna be more new startups coming into the market. And I think that's the really interesting part. Now, what are the cons? Well, first and foremost is that, you know, the, the vendors today don't just build the boxes and sell it to you. They actually put the, the entire system together, okay? Now, if you start buying, buying things here and there from different vendors, who's going to put them together? You know, this is kind of complex. It's not plug and play. This is very complex things to do. So, uh, you know, again, the vendors did this in the past and they do day to day for the operators. But if you want to break it down, you have to find someone else who bring it back. Uh, back. And, you know, the risk is that now you, you're gonna end up again with a few large companies which are the one that can make the aggregation. And uh, we've seen this already happening today. You know, that's a good, I think this is a very good uh, point for discussion and maybe that's the way to go. And if you look about, you know, computing is open, you can buy motherboards and memory from different things, but mostly today think people buy things from Dell, HP. So there's still, you know, a few small um, industry integrating. So maybe it's the way the same, but for sure, it's give us the possibility to do very interesting thing research on real life systems. So I think this is the main pros uh, for us. Now, how did we use this for research, open interfaces? Now, these are just some example of what we did uh, earlier on. Now, here we built a use case, okay? We imagine that, uh, I mean, we connected Bristol and TCD uh, for this uh, test, but imagine that Bristol is a network operator in the UK. It offers services to the UK, and there is AR Flix, which is augmented reality service, uh, hypothetical that needs to control the capacity, okay? It doesn't just work as broadband. It really needs to control latency and capacity. Now, it works fine in the, in the UK, but now they want to service customers in Ireland. Now, in order for that to work, it means that Bristol really need to control. It's not just having some percentage of capacity. They need to control the latency and the bandwidth that you get on, on in Trinity. Trinity, is, let's say, is an Irish operator, right? And so how do they do that? And you know, the idea is that they really need to come in and control our system, okay? And they, you know, they don't just want to have bandwidth forever. You know, they just want, to have, it's a new service, so they just want to trial it. So they only want to pay for the bandwidth that's actually used. So the idea here is that we put this uh, test bit, the demo set up together, okay? And the idea is that now Bristol can control through a control plane uh, API our 
optical network as also our wireless network. And we did a live video that you can drop there later on if you want, where, you know, we'll say you have two base station, we, we keep our base station as a best effort maybe, and we allow Bristol to control the other base station, the bandwidth, so that it can change the bandwidth of the base station depending on the traffic that they use. You know, how many clients are needed, what the clients are doing. And, you know, this is made possible because now base stations are open. So we use SRS LTE here, it's an open source base station. We have built our own version of the PON uh, in software and the STN controllers you know, can operate over boxes like Rodems, which are also open. So that's what it enables. Another example, the edge problem. I mean, densification means uh, that you need to provide capacity for a lot of small cells and base station. How do you do that cost effectively? Okay. I mean, today, the, be the most cost-effective way of giving broadband, high-speed broadband, you know, of the megabits, sorry, gigabits per second, um, is a passive optical network. Okay, unless you have, you know, Virgin Media that already provides a cable service that's hard to compete with. But if you don't have that, and in, in Europe, I think it's most of the cases, you need to create, you need to put in new fiber. Okay, if you do that, you use a passive optical network, which is very cost-effective, but it works as a point to multipoint. Okay, one central office to multiple users. Now, if you look at edge computing, which means is there, uh, you know, to speed up, to uh, lower the latency, the, the idea is that how do you co connect these edge nodes into the access network? Because now, you know, a tree structure like a pond doesn't make much sense because the packets have to go back and forward to the central office and, you know, you don't have any, you reduce all your latency advantage. So you need a system that is able, that's cost effective as a pawn, but it can still interconnect the edge node among themselves. Okay, so like these guys need to be interconnected across themselves without having to go to the central office. So again, this allows us to think new architecture. Okay, so develop a passive optical network where we can have reflective splitters, sorry, a splitter with a reflective field so that signals get back straight away at the first entry point, okay? So things don't go back to the network and, and back again. They are just redirected locally. And you can do that dynamically. And then, you know, with virtualization, you can decrease the complexity because you can organize, you can think of this just a virtual system of endpoints connected together and also overlap uh, the cells as you need. I, I'm going very fast here, but uh, I just want to leave time for discussion. <clears throat> so these, you know, these are performance evaluation. And again, we were able to do this because we can open up the passive optical network. I mean, with Intel, we have developed a full Compliant, standard compliant pawn where you know we can run all of it on software uh, in a normal processor or we can run part in software pine fpga but the idea is that now we can really experiment you know you can get real data to see whether does this the concept of reflecting signal works or not so what can we do next and i think i'm going to be within my 10 minutes so uh, Dirk can mention that we just launched Open Ireland, which is Ireland's new open networking testbed. So the scope of this testbed is to do research on end-to-end -end system that are open, okay? So it's based, so the, it's, it looks at, it's end-to-end -end because it looks at wireless, optical, and cloud, and it's based on op open interfaces. That's the first thing, and open sources as far as possible. And again, you know, this is exactly the same that we did before, but now we can do it in a scale, now we can do it in a city, and now we can also have other people working with us or, you know, or, or even working independently to develop more thing on the testbed. And this is really what we we'll want to do. You know, we want to look at infrastructure sharing, sharing services, sharing within operator, can we, should we use smart contracts? and so on. We, we're interested in network orchestration. I mean, the AI-driven automation is really, really one of the key things that you can do there, but you can do a lot of things. You can put services, you know, tourist application maybe with WCD Council, uh, you know, can be trial there and so on. So this is gonna be a physical infrastructure around the city. Uh, you know, the first stage one plans is to have a dark, it's all dark fiber, so we can do anything that we want. Dark fiber ring around the Docklands, a connection to DCU, and a number of base station. And in Trinity, we have all of the optical transmission equipment. So it's not just wireless, it's wireless optical and cloud. So 2000 kilometer fiber transmission. And really, you know, this makes you, they really enables experimentation of the end to end. And the idea is that, you know, once you have the technology sorted out, then you can scale it out. Yeah, sorry, you can come up, okay? So we can add more projects, we can add, you know, the port, we can add the stadiums, and, you know, eventually even more cells around the city. So, and uh, we're open for people to, within Connect, to work with us, and these are just some of the areas that, uh, you know, we have worked before and we are willing to work again. And uh, that's, uh, just want to finish my presentation with the slides. Thanks, guys, for your attention. Thanks very much, Marco. Um, uh, 
Uh, another interesting perspective in particular in, in terms of open networking, and uh, I, I'm, we will come back to that during the Q&A session. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, for, thank you for, for being so much on time. Um, so uh, our next speaker is uh, David McDonald, um, who is uh, co-founder, CEO, and chair of uh, Donalto, uh, where he leads a team of cross-disciplinary experts bringing products and technology in low-energy distributed IoT to a range of industries. Uh, with a particular focus on enabling unification of indoor-outdoor asset tracking um, uh, in a simple, a simple and cost-effective manner. Uh, David is an engineer by background. Uh, he has an MBA from the UCD Smurfit School uh, and also a PhD in lightweight communications. So I'll hand over to, to David. Um, thank you, Dirk. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. All fine. Uh, for some reason, my video can't come on, but hopefully that's not going to cause a problem and I'll just play, play on, Dirk, if that's okay. Uh, thank you very much for the inv invitation this morning to join you on this. Uh, David, sorry to interrupt you. It's it's difficult. I, I mean, I'm not sure whether it's, it's just me or others, but what we see is the, the PowerPoint. Yes. Rather than, but the, the, the PowerPoint, the, the app view, not the presentation view. Oh, excuse me. Yes, yes, I got it. Bear with me one moment. No. Okay. No. Still not. Still not right. Excuse me. No, it was just it just flashed up there for a second and it's gone now again. Hey, are you seeing my screen there for the moment, Dirk? Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe. Stay on this view for the moment, if that's okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. That, that'll okay. work. Well, okay. thank you very much for uh, inviting me this morning. Uh, what I wanted to do this morning is basically take you to a slightly different end of the uh, smart networking spectrum over into the IoT space and particularly some of the work uh, uh, that uh, Donalto is pursuing on our technical side and give you a flavor of who we are and also how this resonates with some of the points that the other speakers have actually made as well. So let me just, uh, just say who we are and what we do. So first of all, Donalto, we're actually a software company, okay? We're delivering software, d distributed software for edge, uh, sorry, for device edge and cloud uh, provision of uh, positioning intelligence for the IoT devices. So fundamentally, uh, we take a view of um, IoT and we're very focused on the low power, low energy sector of that. And we're looking at providing a uniform view of positioning. And what we're looking at is actually where things are for an, a multitude of uh, applications in and around asset tracking and positioning intelligence, irrespective of the radio bearer. Now, saying it's, uh, we're, it's independent of the radio bearer, we are fairly much focused on unlicensed band technologies here. Now, as I said, seamless precision and position intelligence, this is becoming more of a table stake requirement for uh, the Internet of Things as we see it, and has really spurred the adoption and the uh, deployment of some technologies such as BLE, but we feel that there's a lot more work to be done there, and particularly as we move into larger scale, and as energy consumption becomes more and more focused as those uh, technology scale up. I think one of the points that was resonant there, particularly with Marco, uh, with respect to the disaggregation point that he mentioned is around an ecosystem. So I think IoT in particular is one that has suffered greatly from not being able to develop um, vibrant ecosystems of partners and players, uh, technical and commercial, in order to actually drive the adoption of these types of technologies. So we work with large scale um, IoT hardware and system implementers and on applications that exploit the new, unique capabilities of the platform that we're actually providing here. And I'll go into some more detail around that in these later slides. Now, uh, I think this is, this is uh, present on every slide that I've seen from all the other speakers this morning. And it's just that distributed intelligence uh, requirement from the point that uh, Cormac made around data-driven networking um, through the ability for autonomous uh, self-reliance and ability for local decision-making to be made on a ML AI basis 
uh, from Kevin through to the need for dis dis disaggregation of the network and to allow the intelligence to sit from the edge device. And we're talking about really low power, low energy devices that could be deployed for multiple years, right back into the infrastructure, infrastructure centric view of the world and into the cloud where uh, most and more intelligence actually is being deployed. So it's across that whole gap um, that we view and our product and software is actually deployed into. Now, where, where do we play? We're really over in the massive IoT space using the Ericsson uh, ruler here of IoT. Um, and what we mean there is the massive IoT, you look at very analysis, variable, very uh, analysts and the types of numbers that they expect to be in there from a device centric perspective. You're into tens to hundreds of billions uh, over the next five to 10 years in various form from the home into the industrial side and pervasively across all parts of civic society. So in that regard, the question is, how does this intelligence get broken out in order to provide services into that segment of the Internet of Things? And this is where the smart networks and how they evolve is quite an important aspect here. So what we see is there's four real landing spots here um, in order to provide service. So if we take a, a, a tracking or logistics application, and again, you have to consider it from the data layer at the top right to the device at the very bottom and the network that it subtends in order to deliver that service. In our case, we're very focused on that positioning service. So that means that you have to come through the cloud, you have to come through the edge, the actual uh, the edge device. Now in our case, the internet is there, okay? There is backhaul requirement. So we're expecting the operators and the other providers to, to do that work. But at the same time, there's also a need potentially to, to bypass that network, depending on the type of uh, deployment that is required for particularly enterprises and to be autonomous. Also, there's also a need to be compatible to uh, private networks license or own license uh, that you need to be able to design into and be able to deploy your intelligence. And then finally, there's the end device itself with respect to uh, being able to support components that provide the intelligence that allow, that allow you then to basically knit these three, four things together to provide the ultimate intelligence northbound to the end application. So it's that integration, smart operations at the top, down into the connected products at the bottom, and to have a distributed uh, low energy orchestration technology platform that subtends across those. That is what our life is spent doing, looking at what is the best means, independent of the radio bearer and where the radio uh, uh, technology from a connectivity and from an inference perspective that needs to be employed here to provide the intelligence back to the application. So just to add a little bit more uh, context and color to that. Obviously on the device side, uh, the, 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 the focus is always around functionality and efficiency in providing that function. The next thing is in the radio layer itself. And again, we're very focused on wireless and predominantly unlicensed wireless uh, protocols and waveforms. It's predominantly all around capacity, scale, and multi-barrier capability, and the invariable uh, movement by all radio types to an SDR platform that allows multiple generations of types of radios to be deployed seamlessly as uh, the whole IoT network scale out. Within the cloud, then it's, and again, this was talked, I think Cormac uh, mentioned this point with respect to the, basically the tooling part and the data delivery part uh, so tooling is an important element for ourselves because a key thing that has really been missing to date is making things easy, okay? And how do you make the delivery of a service as easy as possible across a range of um, open source or um, disaggregated players in a broader ecosystem? That's what we're interested in. How do you pull those together? And that requires uh, an orchestration platform that democratizes those layers and bring those, those partners together. And then finally, the applications. And these applications are maturing. They are maturing quite rapidly. And they're being driven by you know, good uh, 
arguments such as economics, uh, scale, and the need to uh, achieve single skew, which is a key thing, that's stock keep unit, um, uh, uniformly, globally, that is accessible for any print prize or any technology partner that's able to uh, deliver a, a service to the Internet of Things. So this is one of the slides that how we map intelligence, positioning intelligence across the various radio bearers or uh, technologies that are, uh, that are available or coming to the fore. So on the left hand side, you have the indoor technologies. On the right hand side, the outdoor technologies. Indoor, you know, you've got UWB, very high density infrastructure required for that, but really accurate down to sub 10 centimeters. Over on the right, GNSS, ultra low requirement, uh, requirement for infrastructure uh, and good precision, but it's outdoor only. So one of the areas that, and again, with respect to uh, the point I made uh, earlier, uh, with respect to uh, bringing indoor and outdoor uh, position intelligence uniformly to various industries and applications, uh, we are, developing technologies that basically span between the outdoor and indoor that are independent of GNSS, that are independent of UWB, for example, but are seamlessly integrated to them. So in other words, we're looking to bring out a range of products that actually subtend from UWB to GNSS with radio technologies that are able to span between outdoor and indoor. Okay, and these are technologies that have similar properties from an energy perspective as LoRa, as you would know in the sub gig band, but precisions in the single digit meter uh, capabilities uh, comparable to the GNSS type of accuracies that are everyone's familiar with. In terms of the stack and just give a little bit of flavor on uh what are the the components within that stack and in that ecosystem and they herald back to some of the points that uh, marco made again with respect to disaggregation and with respect to um open open source and open platform like we're a we're a cloud native company okay so everything's set in the context of software everything's set in the context of open source capability and portability of function to any edge gateway to any edge device to any radio bearer. Okay, that's the sort of background that we have. And this is all with respect to deployment, adoption, which are key components when you're talking into a, an OEM or solutions implementer ecosystem, which we are. And in that instance, you know, the key things for us are the application layers in the device end or in the edge gateway side, and the commensurate comm stacks that are sitting on top of these, irrespective of they sit on 868, 2.4, 1.5, or UWB frequencies in the three to 10 gig band. At the end, at the back end, you know, it's all around the orchestration of this service, which is core to uh, what we do, uh, where timing obviously is a key element of that and how timing is controlled, managed right through the network. So as you can see, the, the ability and the need to orchestrate, control, manage, and put the center of, uh, how would you say, computation, and intelligence at the right point in these three points that we've described here is quite critical. Okay, because at the end of the, at the end of the day, it's around providing that intelligence over a long period of time at the right price point. Just to wrap up, um, give you a little bit of flavour on some of the areas that we're looking at from a consumer, a customer uh, a point of view that have been enabled through those type of technologies. So one, and again. I've used an aircraft uh, manufacturing site slide here. Not the best industry right now, but it shows you the scale where this is important. Uh, lot, manufacturing and man lot manufacturing tracking in manufacturing is currently a really large underserved area and uh, one that uh, has not been solved because of the economics, because of the skew capability, the, the, the need for a single stock keep unit globally and the need to reach a large scale. Another one is actually on in the mining sector, which is uh, an active area for us. And it's around automated tracking on the basis of a certain uh, sensitive and key times in operations, such as blast operations. Again, given where mines are actually deployed, this is a, a poorly served 
area and currently cannot be solved with incumbent technologies. Um, and particularly, as you know, mines are usually found very north uh, near the Arctic or in very tough terrain. And this is where uh, this type of technology is highly, highly applicable. And then finally, and probably the, the largest uh, market that is uh, needing to be, I would say, radically put under a uniform state is actually logistics and distribution. Um, and this is where we're looking at areas such as operator cost allocation, okay, around various points of the distribution chain where um, low energy, low cost IoT is quite important. I'll just stop there, Dirk, and apologies for the problems with the slides earlier. Well, no problem. Thank you very much, David. Um, so again, audience, please keep questions coming. There were two answered questions already. I hope you can see them. Um, so we come to our uh, final fi final speaker, um, uh, uh, Donna O'Shea from CIT. Donna holds uh, the chair of cybersecurity at Cork Institute of Technology, and she is a, a, a principal investigator in the SFI Research uh, Center Confirm, an investigator in uh, in the um, in, in Connect and Enable. Uh, she leads the REIF uh, Group on Intelligent Secure Systems at CIT. Her expertise lies in the area of uh, enterprise security, particularly in SDN and uh, NFB security and network and service management. Um, before uh, returning to academia after her PhD, she spent five years in IBM, which exposed her to, uh, um, to rigorous design principles, which uh, are a prerequisite to successful large-scale systems development. Uh, Donna, um, apart from uh, being passionate about research, she's also, also passionate about promoting science and technology as a career for women and men, and she's a director of uh, IT, uh, the IT at Cork Industry Network. Uh, so this will be interesting uh, talk uh, because security is something that's on all of our minds, so I'll hand over to Donna. So many thanks, Dirk, for the introduction. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, the title of my presentation today is basically Future Network Security. And as part of my talk, I intend to highlight, in essence, some of the various layers and abstractions involved in securing our networks. Um, this is really targeted at a kind of a mid-level technical audience. Uh, if I was really going to go into a kind of a deep technical um, dive and you know, future network security, I would have to go right down to the SDN and NFE. But really, this is kind of more of a broader overview. Um, so I intend to start off with just basically an overview of the current threat landscape as I currently see it, with particular reference to the Internet of Things, the relationship between the Internet of Things and 5G, and then kind of uh, the challenges surrounding um, 5G network security, which can be quite complex. So I think everybody in the audience knows what the Internet of Things is or are, but basically the Internet of Things is about extending the power of the internet beyond traditional devices such as computers and smartphones. And these connect things will have the ability to communicate with each other and with the internet, transmitting data, giving us deeper understanding of how these things actually work and how they interact together. And with the Internet of Things and Industry 4.0, we're going to have a plethora of new device types with less homogeneity and they'll be connected to a new and broader range of applications and services. And it is expected that the Internet of Things will have a hugely disruptive impact on a whole host of energies. And this is most certainly true. Um, but the reality is, is that the Internet of Things have also made our digital environments more complicated and more difficult to secure. There have been numerous studies supporting this and numerous attacks also supporting um, this particular claim. But in a recent and quite, um, I suppose, well-known study by Eula Packard on commercialized IoT devices, it found that 90% of devices collected at least one piece of personal information and 80% of devices failed to require passwords of sufficient complexity and linked and 70% of devices uses uncrypted network services. I guess adding to this complexity is that current IT systems lack visibility of IoT devices and existing endpoint protection systems which are designed for computers, tablets and phones with the ability to run agents are not able to run on IoT devices, which often run custom or outdated operating systems. And as a result, IT systems 
do CIOT devices as unknown endpoints and as a result do not know what the specific device type actually is its risk profile or its expected behavior. And this is adding to huge complexity. And these security issues are actually exasperated given the fact that the threat um, surface of IoT devices makes it much broader. And as a result, security needs to go beyond, beyond the physical device of IoT themselves. And it must include a much broader ecosystem, which includes 5G, um, such as the interacting devices, the edge, the cloud, the mobile, the whole thing. And within this landscape, um, you know, cybercrime has become very professionalized. We exist in a world where well-resourced criminal gangs work in partnership with nation states. Exploit kits are developed and sold by criminals, and this has made it much easier um, for those without technical knowledge to perpetrate cyber attacks and has led to a rise in volume of attacks. And then finally, we're in a situation where there exists a global shortage of cybersecurity professionals to help defend their networks. Reports indicate that there is currently 0% unemployment in cybersecurity, with a reported 3.5 million unfilled jobs predicted by 2021. And what's most interesting about this is that the greatest demand for these cybersecurity professionals will exist in the US and Ireland. So this is, you know, I guess, I'm trying to join IoT with 5G and most of you will already know the relationship, but you know, connectivity is the heart of IoT and 5G is going to be a big foundation technology for the enablement of the applications for IoT. And, and if we go across the various generations, you know, first generation was about voice, second generation voice text, third generation voice text data, fourth generation was 3G but faster, and 5G would be faster again, providing a unique combination of high-speed connectivity, ultra-reliable, very low latency, ubiquitous coverage, um, and that would support, I suppose, a whole host of new applications where a split-second delay could mean the difference between a smooth flow of traffic to a major traffic incident. And 5G refers to the entire ecosystem of IoT, Industry 4.0, cloud, internet services, and supporting technology. And 5G is the first generation that was designed with virtualization and cloud-based technology in mind. And with this technology, such as SDN, it's now possible to flexibly configure routing paths between dynamically configured virtualized network functions. It's also possible to support multi-tenancy and slicing on virtual networks on a single substrate, allowing the creation of what we call mobile virtual network operators. And security challenges is not just a new thing in, in mobile communications. There has been an evolution of security challenges over these various generation of mobile communication systems. In the first generation, you know, um, it had a problem of illegal cloning and masquerading. In the second generation, message spamming was a problem. In the third generation, suddenly we were connecting devices to the internet. And so we had internet security vulnerability and challenges for the first time ever in mobile networks. And with the fourth generation, you know, we suddenly have a proliferation of smart devices and multimedia traffic. And this again added to a more complicated and dynamic threat landscape. The issue is with the advent of 5G, SDN, NFE, multi-tenancy and cloud, the notion of a physical parameter or a physical perimeter around your network no longer exists um, because typically this would have been developed and supported by using dedicated hardware. Um, with, but these dedicated hardware are now going to be virtualized as network functions. And so this fixed notion of a parameter is not going to exist within 5G. And this is um, adding uh, significant, significant security challenges. So I think it's important to reflect on the entire threat landscape in 5G. And we talked briefly about um, the user plane and the internet of thing types devices. But the reality is that security is a multi-dimensional subject and there is going to be a diversity of devices and services which make it even more complex. If we look at um, in the user plane, you know, we're, we're talking about challenges surrounding wireless transmission intercepts. And as we saw from the Euler Packard um, survey, 80% of uh, data is actually unencrypted. So if we are able to collect this wireless data, the wireless data can be intercepted and confidential information can be compromised. And this is a big challenge. Um, if we have a huge amount of Internet of Things, these Internet of Things could 
be infected with malware, um, and a botnet um, could be formed against a mobile operator's network, which could launch a distributed denial of service attack. Just think about the famous Mariah attack and the impact that that had. Um, and for network operators, what this means is that they need to be able to differentiate between legitimate um, denial of service attacks or legitimate flash network traffic. Let's just say if Ireland won the Rugby World Cup, then suddenly you would have a huge number of users maybe accessing an application service in the cloud. And this would be legitimate traffic. But how does a network operate, operator distinguish between this legitimate traffic and actually a distributed denial of service attack caused by your Internet of Things type devices? Um, so that's, that's really very complicated to be able to identify. We also have a problem with radio interface keys radio interface keys that are generated in the home network and then sent to the visiting network. Um, you know, they're actually sent over insecure links and um, these keys should not be sent over SS7 or diameter and network operators need to develop new ways of sending these links between the home and visiting network. We also have challenges around subscriber level user policies where, you know, user security measures basically must be intact as the user moves from one operator to another. Um, and so network operators need to be able to share um, some type of security information and also some subscriber level information. And this may involve using virtualization techniques to enable precise configuration and um, basically to keep the security profile of the user intact as they move from one network to the other. And then we also have challenges around user pane integrity and um, user pane on the radio interface is basically not integrity protected. And this means it is possible to um, perform data injection um, or modification attacks such as uh, man in the middle attacks um, and 3G and 4G did provide some protection of some signaling messages um, but did not provide any cryptographic integrity protection for the user data plane and this problem still exists in 5G. And then we also have the big problem of denial of service or distributed denial of service attacks on the network operator themselves. Um, and in this environment, we're specifically talking about attacks based on vulnerabilities related to network slicing, SDN, NFE, and attacks include saturation attacks, fingerprinting attacks, SDN rootkits, topology poisoning, host location hijacking, link fabrication, information disclosure, flow entry flooding, firmware abuse, control, message manipulation, the list goes on. Okay, so where do we go? Um, I guess I agree with the vision that the next generation mobile communication systems has outlined in 5G system security, and that's why I have a picture of it here. Uh, the first thing to recognize is that 5G is not an incremental advancement over 4G. Security systems need to be redesigned um, according to the new design principles um, and architecture requirements that 5G actually have. And according to the next generation mobile networks, it's based on three principles, which include supreme built-in security. And what I mean by this is that 5G will accumulate very diverse technologies, which will introduce new security vulnerabilities in the network. And we need to build in security at the very outset. Um, and this involves considering security at a design phase rather than a bolt on. Um, and if you have security by design, you also need to consider how to verify this as well. So it's really not that easy to do. We need to look at flexible security measures. And we're talking about diversity. Uh, and diversity re requires a system to adjust and adapt. Um, in order to achieve this, we're relying on SDN and NFE, um, where the challenges of surrounding diversity can be limited through, I suppose, policy-based yet centralized network control. And finally, as the other speakers were talking about earlier on, we're talking about automation. And as part of the vision, AI and automation will play a key role in the development of algorithms that leverage the centralized view of network state to reconfigure network base, the network based on the security requirements of the user, the application, and the services. So central to all of this, um, and I suppose because we're talking about SDN and NFE, um, SDN and NFE allow the creation of uh, network slices, and there are two different types of network slicing, vertical and horizontal, which I'm not going to go into in detail. But a vertical slice is the slice that most people are aware of, and it's formed by a set of network functions and resources, uh, the deployment of these functions forming a complete logical network to meet certain characteristics for a specific service. And network slicing is really important to 5G networks um, because we will support a wide range of services and use cases 
across different vertical industries, as this diagram actually shows. And each of these services are going to impose their own set of requirements to the network in terms of security, latency, elasticity, resiliency, and bandwidth. And a key requirement defined by 3GGP is to support performance and isolation within these network slices. And in the data plane, performance isolation means that actions, which basically means rules and flows in one slice should have no impact on other slices, whereas in the control plane, it means life cycle changes, um, which means create, update, delete of new slices should not influence or impact currently active ones. And isolation should prevent the occurrence of denial of service, distributed denial of service, packet in flooding, man in the middle attacks, phantom storms, topology poisoning attacks, and, and it should prevent these types of attacks from impacting other slices. And a key challenge here is how do we enable security and isolation um, in the control plane between the network slices and whether we have to achieve a balance between performance and security and the trade-off between performance and security in this regard. And then we're going down to the very last layer. So, you know, we're talking about the IoT, then we went to 5G network security, then we went to, um, you know, and network slicing. And a key enabling technology of this is SDN. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail on the whole host of security challenges in SDN, but there are loads of them here. And I tried to put in a picture um, to describe um, the various uh, threats um, that exist at the various layers of the SDN architecture. But just to summarize, um, because SDN is an enabling technology to reconfigure and to solve security challenges, it is by nature a new technology and introduce security challenges as well. And these challenges exist across the different layers of the SDN architecture. And the, as a highlight, these challenges include access control um, at the northbound, southbound, southbound um, communication security. Um, I suppose the challenge here is that open flow specification details, uh, transport layer security as an optional rather than a requirement. And what we're finding um, is that a lot of switches um, don't have TLS supported by default. Um, we do have the issue of controller or performance within the SDN environment um, being affected by intentional uh, denial of service attacks um, arriving at both the northbound, southbound, eastbound, east and westbound interfaces. We have issues of control layer fault tolerance um, maintaining a cluster of controllers. Um, we have problems with application vetting and vulnerabilities, uh, network topology poisoning, policy violations, um, and um, all of these challenges make the threat landscape in SDN uh, particularly complex and difficult to solve. So I, I'm not sure if I'm over time or under time, but I guess I kind of wanted to finish up with, a, I suppose, a, a few final words. Um, and that's just my own personal vision for future network security. And I, I believe that the future network security is more or less should be aligned to what the next generation mobile networks vision is. Um, but my hope is that the future network security is going to go beyond technology. And I hope that in the future, we'll develop technology and algorithms um, to help us as society solve some of the most pressing challenges that we're facing today, which include areas around critical infrastructure protection and also threats to our own citizens and election and terrorist hacking. Um, my vision for security is to create a system to respond effectively to this complex threat landscape with the ability to prevent, detect and respond, providing deep and meaningful insights and forensics while at the same time recognizing that the network itself is a source of vulnerability, mis misuse and malfunction. And the challenge here I see will be in creating expressive algorithms to reconfigure our underlying networks in response to changing application and security requirements through enabling technologies such as SDN and NFE and optimizing scale the resources to meet the performance requirements, prioritizing security in the face of threats and attacks. And that's the vision that I have for future network security. I'd love to talk to you if you have any interest in investigating these challenges and I have provided my email address here as well. So thank you. Thanks very much, Donna. And that, that was a interesting uh, concluding talk actually, because I think, um, you know, security often is, is an afterthought and perhaps we actually should have had you at the beginning rather than at the end of this to make sure that it's, you know, it, it, uh, it stops being an afterthought. So uh, I would like to thank uh, all of our six uh, presenters very much uh, for the presentation.